The days of my youth, as I look back on them, seem to fly away from me in a flurry of pale repetitive scraps, like those morning snowed storms of used tissue paper that a train passenger sees whirling in the wake of the observation car. In my sanitary relations with women, I was practical, ironical and brisk. While a college student in London and Paris paid ladies sophist me. My studies were meticulous and intense, although not particularly fruitful. At first I planned to take a degree in psychiatry as many manquier talents do. But I was even more manquier than that, a peculiar exhaustion. I am so oppressed, doctor said in. And I switched to English literature where so many frustrated poets end as pipe-smoking teachers in tweets. Paris suited me. I discussed Soviet movies with expatriates. I sat with urinists in De Magot. I published tortuous essays in obscure journals. I composed pastiches. Fräulein von Gulp may turn her hand upon the door. I will not follow her, nor Fresca, nor the Gull. A paper of mine entitled The Proustian Theme in a Letter from Kids to Benjamin Bailey was chuckled over by the six or seven scholars who read it. I launched upon an Histoire abrégée de la poésie anglaise for a prominent publishing firm and then started to compile that manual of French literature for English-speaking students with, with comparisons drawn from English writers, which was to occupy me throughout the 40s and the last volume of which was almost ready for press by the time of my arrest. I found a job teaching English to a group of adults in Auteuil, Auteuil. Then a school for boys employed me for a couple of winters. Now and then I took advantage of acquaintances I had formed among social workers and psychotherapists to visit in their company various institutions such as orphanages and reform schools where pale pubescent girls with matted eyelashes could be stared at in perfect impunity, remindful of what had granted one in dreams. Now I wish to introduce the following idea. Between the age limits of 9 and 14, there occur maidens who, to certain bewitched travelers, twice or many times older than they, reveal their true nature, which is not human, but nymphic that is, demoniac, and these chosen creatures I propose to designate as nymphets. It will be marked that I substitute time terms for special ones. In fact, I would have uh, the reader see 9 and 14 as the boundaries, the mirrored beaches of rosy rocks and rosy rocks, of an enchanted island uh, haunted by those nymphets of mine and surrounded by a vast misty sea. Between those age limits, are all girl children infants? Of course not. Otherwise, we who are in the known, we long voyagers, we nymphollets, would have long gone insane. Neither are good looks any criterion, and vulgarity, or at least what a given community term so, does not necessarily impair certain mysterious characteristics, the fee grace, the elusive, shifty, soul-shattering, insidious charm that separates the nymphet from such co of hers as are incomparably more dependent on the spatial world of synchronous phenomena than on that intangible island of entranced time where Lolita plays with her likes. Within the same age limits, the number of true nymphets is strikingly inferior, uh, inferior to that of provisionally playing or just nice or cute or even sweet and attractive ordinary plumpish, formless, cold-skinned, essentially human little girls with tummies and pigtails who may or may not turn into adults of great beauty. Look at the ugly dumplings in back stockings and white hats that are metamorphosed into stunning stars of the screen. A normal man giving a group of a group photograph of school girls or girl scouts and asked to point out the comeliest one will not necessarily choose the nymphet among them. You have to be an artist and a madman, a creature of infinite melancholy with a bubble of hot poison in your loins and a super 
voluptuous flame permanently aglow in your subtle spine. Oh, how you have to cringe and hide. In order uh, to discern at once by ineffable signs the slightly filling outline of a cheekbone, the slenderness of a downy glimp, and other indices which despair and shame and tears uh, of tenderness forbid me to tabulate, uh, the little deadly demon among the wholesome children. She stands unrecognized by them and unconscious herself of her fantastic power. Furthermore, the idea Furthermore, since the idea of time plays such a magic part in the matter, the student should not be surprised to learn uh, that there must be a gap of several years, never less than ten, I should say, generally thirty or forty, and as many as ninety in a few known cases, between maiden and man, to enable the latter to come under an infant's spell. It is a question of focal adjustment, of a certain distance that the inner eye thrills to surmount, and a certain contrast that the mind perceives with a gasp of perverse delight. When I was a child, and she was a child, my little Annabelle was no nymph to me. I was her equal, a foundlet, foundlet in my own right, on that same enchanted island of time. But today, in September 1952, after 29 years have elapsed, I think I can distinguish in her the initial faithful elf in my life. We loved each other with a premature love, marked by a fierceness that so often destroys adult lives. I was a strong lad and survived, but the poison was in the wound, and the wound remained ever open. And soon I found myself muttering amid a civilization which allows a man of 25 to court a girl of 16, but not a girl of 12. No wonder then that my adult, that my adult di life during the European period of my existence proved monstrously twofold. Overtly, I had so-called normal relationships with a number of terrestrial women having pumpkins or pears for breasts. In me, I was consumed by a health furnace of localized lust for every passing infant who must love a beating poltron I never dared approach. The human females I was allowed to wield were but palliative agents. I am ready to believe that the sensations I derived from natural fornication were much the same as those known to normal big males consulting with the normal big mates in that routine rhythm which shakes the world. The trouble was that those gentlemen had not, and I had, caught glimpses of an incomparably more poignant bliss. The dimmest of my pollutive dreams was a thousand times more dazzling than all the adultery the most virile writer of genius or the most talented impotent might imagine. My world was split. I was aware of not one but two sexes, neither of which was mine. Both would be termed female by the anatomist, but to me, through the prism of my senses, they were as different as mist and mast. All this I rationalize now. In my twenties and early thirties I did not understand my throes quite so clearly. While my body knew that what, I, what it craved for, my mind rejected my body's every plea. One moment I was ashamed and frightened, and another I was recklessly optimistic. Taboos strangulated me. Psychoanalysts wooed me uh, with pseudo-liberations or pseudo-libidos. The fact that to me the only objects of amorous tremor were sisters of Annabelle's, her handmaids and girl pages, appeared to me at times as a forerunner of insanity. At other times I would tell myself that it was uh, all a question of attitude, that there was really nothing wrong in being moved by dis uh, to distraction by girl children. Let me remind my reader that in England, with the passage of the Children and Young Person Act in 1933, the term girl child is defined as a girl who is over 8 but under 14 years. After that, from 14 to 17, the statutory definition is young person. In Massachusetts, US, on the other hand, a wayward child is technically one between 7 and 17 years of age, who moreover habitually associates with vicious or immoral persons. Hugh Brockton, a writer of controversy in the reign of James I, has proved that Rahab 
was a harlot at 10 years of age. This is all very interesting and I dare say you see me already frothing at the mouth in a fit, but no I'm not. I'm just winking happy thoughts into a little teal cap. Here are some more pictures. Here's Virgil, who could the nymphet sing in single tongue, but probably preferred a lat's perineum. Here are two of King Akhanen, Akhnatens and Queen Nefertiti's prenubial, Nile daughters. That royal couple had a little, of si a little of six, wearing nothing but many necklaces of bright beds, relaxed on cushions, intact after 3,000 years, with their soft brown puppy bodies, cropped hair and long ebony eyes. Here are some brides of ten compelled to seat themselves on the fascinum, the virile ivory, ivory <laughs> in the temples of classical scholarship, marriage and cohabitation, before the age of puberty are still not uncommon in certain East Indian provinces. Lepsha old men in 80 copulate with girls of eight, and nobody minds. After all, Dante fell madly in love with his Beatrice when she was nine, a sparkling girl, sorry, a sparkling girling, painted and lovely and bejeweled in a crimson frock, and this was in 12. 74 in Florence at a private feast in the merry month of May. And when Petrarch fell madly in love with his Lorraine, she was a fair haired nymphette of twelve, running in the wind, in the pollen and dust, a flower in flight in the beautiful plain, as described from the hills of Vaucluse. But let us be prim and civilized. Humbert Humbert tried hard to be good. Really and truly he did. He had the utmost respect for ordinary children, with their purity and vulnerability, and under no circumstances would he have interfered with the innocence of a child, if there was the least risk of a role. But how his heart beat when, among the innocent throng, he spied a demon child, enfant charmant et full, dim eyes, bright lips, ten years in jail if you only show her you're looking at her. So life went. Humbert was perfectly capable of intercourse with Eve, but it was Lilith he longed for. The bad stage of breast development appears early, 10.7 years, in the sequence of somatic changes accompanying pubescence. And the next much rational item available is the first appearance of pigmented pubic hair, sorry, pigmented pubic hair, of course, 11.2 years. My little cap brims with tittles. A shipwreck, an atoll, alone with a droned passenger's shivering child. Darling, this is only a game. How marvelous were my fancied adventures as I sat on a hard park bench pretending to be immersed in a trembling book. Around the quiet scholar, Nymphets played freely, as if he were a familiar statue or part of an old tree's shadow and sheen. Once a per once a perfect little beauty in a tartan frock with a clatter put her heavily armed foot near me upon the bench to dip her slimber arms into me and tighten the strap of her roller skate, and I dissolved in the sun. With my book for fig leaf, as her upborn ringlets fell all over her skin knee, and the shadow of leaves I shared pulsated and melted on her radiant limb next to my chameleonic cheek. Another time, a red-haired school uh, girl hung over me in the metal, and the revelation of auxiliary reset I obtained remained in my blood for weeks. I could list a great number of these one-sided diminutive romances. Some of them ended in a rich flavor of hell. It happened, for instance, that from my balcony I would notice a lighted window across the street and what looked like an infant in the act of undressing before a cooperative mirror. Thus isolated, thus removed, the vision acquired an especially keen charm that made me race with all speed toward my long gratification. But abruptly, fiendishly, the tender pattern of nudity I had adored would be transformed into the disgusting lamp-lit bare arm of a man and his underclothes reading his paper by the open window in the hot, damp, hopeless summer night. Rope skipping hopshot, hopscotch that old woman in black who sat down next to me on my bench. On my rack of joy, 
an infant was growing under me for a lost marble, and asked if I had stomach ache, the insolent hack. Ah, leave me alone in my pubescent park, in my mossy garden, let them play around me forever. Never grow up. <laughs>